All right, go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to be reading from Matthew 5.33 and also Ecclesiastes 5 verse 5. I know Ecclesiastes isn't normally a book we read from very often, so go ahead and look that up in your table of contents. It's going to be somewhere near the middle of your Bible. Um, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, I wish I weren't giving a sermon online. I uh, have a sore throat today and I'm staying home and I really miss seeing all of you. So today as we're setting our New Year's resolutions, um, I want to avoid a few pitfalls because when I think of New Year's resolutions, I think of it as a promise to myself. And that's not necessarily helpful to me because when I think of promises, the first thing that I think of is Matthew chapter 5, where in verse 33, Jesus says, Again, you've heard it was said to people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is by the city of the great king. These are all things that are outside of our control. And when we make a promise to someone else, it's usually to give a weight, to give validity, to uh, give our words more value than they would hold on their own. And so we swear by something that is beyond our, ourselves, but we don't really control those things. We don't own those things. We don't own or control God or the temple or the city in which we live. But further than that, Jesus says in verse 36, And do not swear by your own head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Now that's interesting. Because of all the things in my life that I would think that I control, that I can, that I can swear by because I have 100% ownership of it, I would think that it would be myself. But Jesus says, you don't even own yourself. You can't control your own life. God is in control of your life. You can't change the simplest thing about you. How can you swear by that? All you need to do is say simply, yes or no. Let your yes mean yes. Let your no mean no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now, why am I saying that Jesus is talking about controlling our own lives and adding validity to our words. It's because he's quoting from the book of Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes notably is written by Solomon, or at least uh, it's credited to Solomon. And it's written from the perspective of a king, someone who in life should have all the control of anyone in society. This person is going to be in control of his own life. Not only that, He's in charge of the lives of everyone around him. How much can the king swear by? Let's find out in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. In verse 5 he says, It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Does that sound familiar? Do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not protest to the temple messenger my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. So, what he's saying, when you make a vow in the temple, when you make a vow to the temple priest or to, in this case, the temple messenger, um, 
you have to fulfill that vow. Because if you don't fulfill your words, how if you don't do what you say you will do, how can anyone trust you? If you can say, my vow was a mistake, then where is your integrity? But he goes further, why should God be angry at you? Solomon is sitting on his throne and he says, why should God be angry and destroy your work? If you don't see God destroying the work of your hands, it doesn't mean God's not angry that you broke your vow. It means that God is just not taking notice. Why should he? The king doesn't take notice. Why should God be any different? But he could, and that's why Solomon says, therefore, fear God. But Solomon isn't simply saying, don't make your vows. Don't make promises you can't keep. He goes further than that to bring us back to the idea of why are we making vows in the first place? What do we hope to gain? What do we hope to gain from a New Year's resolution? And what kind of resolutions have we made? Typically, it's going to be something like, I want to lose weight this year. I want to be a better person, or I want to be more like Jesus, or I want to earn that promotion at work. And all of these things are things that improve our status in society, our self-image, our, our wealth. But they're things that are tied not only to things that are beyond our control, but they're tied to things that have to do with our own pride. This is what Solomon addresses in verse 8. In fact, he says, If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such thing. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all the king himself, Profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, too, is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? In other words, when we chase status, when we chase wealth, even when we chase our own self-image. These things do nothing to improve our lives because every one of them just means that we have more to spend. We have more to lose. And that's where he moves next with this. He says, as, excuse me, he says, the sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. He reminds us that when we have little, we sleep well. We don't have worries because we have nothing to lose. We don't have to worry about that wealth or that status or that self-image being destroyed because we don't have it to begin with. But those that do have so much to worry about. And what have they gained? They have gained all the world. They have gained everything they wanted, but they have lost their peace of mind, their peace in the spirit, they have lost the joy of life. Solomon then reminds us that everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil, they can carry nothing in their hands. So, as we set our goals this year, 
Let's not ask, what can I achieve? What can I do to increase my own wealth, my own status, my own power, my own control, my own self-image? Let's ask, what can I do to increase my peace of mind, my purpose in the spirit? What can I do to advance my image in the, in the image of God? How can I better reflect my creator? Because when we do this, we let go of ambition. We let go of the self and we achieve peace. Let's not ask, what do I want to do this year? Let's ask, who do I want to be? Do I want to be more like Jesus? That's a nebulous thing. Name one trait of Jesus that you want to work on this year. I want to be more kind. I realize that I am not naturally a kind person. This is my goal as a Christian, to be more kind, to be more thoughtful of others. And the way that I'm going to measure this is I'm going to measure how often I'm checking in on others. I'm going to measure how often I have kind words and how often do I have words that speak of only myself? Now, I realize I'm probably in the wrong line of work for measuring this by how often do I speak only of myself. <laughs> because it's kind of my job to get up here and say, here's the message I have from you for, from scripture for this week. But I don't know that that's really the same thing. How are you going, what, who do you want to be this year? And how are you going to measure how you're becoming that person? So that's the question I want to leave you with. Who do you want to be?